Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Omnia Performance Podcast with myself and Dr. Phil Price. Johnny is absent, as he was last week, as I've already mentioned in last week's intro. So he is at home with family commitments, which means that we are here without family commitments. I mean, right now. <laughs> anyway, so today we're going to discuss why everybody should be doing some form of resistance training and clear up a couple of things around the topic. But before we do so, a couple of requests. First and foremost, just to remind you in the show notes down below, we have a link for you to access Omnia Performance Premium, which is our online members community focused on education. So there's seminars in there, there's lectures in there from Dr. Phil focused on the real nitty gritty science and understanding of why hybrid training is the way it is. Johnny and I will then dive into the logistics, planning, programming, all of the sort of more anecdotal stuff in terms of how you can apply the science that Phil delivers. There is a Q&A every month that you can jump in on and is recorded for you to view afterwards. There are premium podcast features. There is a coaches community. There is a global chat room for our premium members. And there is a research database, which is being slowly populated. We are essentially releasing things in a month by month basis. So sign up now so that you can get involved. Alongside that, do all the podcast stuff, follow, subscribe, rate, review, share with a friend. Cheers. Conscious have taken up lots of your time. So we're going to dive right in. Phil. Why is resistance training so important? Go. Tolerance. <laughs> so okay. thank you I... for listening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> nice and succinct. I I think that you are deliberately trying to improve the uh, tolerance of your system. Let's call your system the human body. Uh, so that could be muscle, that could be tendon, it could be ligament, it could be bone, whatever it might be. And we try and apply force to it in some means through exercise to try and improve its tolerance so it can deal with that stress again. Uh, and you know, it, it has the ability that if you throw anything at it, it, it should be able to deal with that type of stress. Because you know life is chaotic, sports even more chaotic. So we need to train to try and enable our body to be able to um, improve its tolerance to this stress. So that means we'll be able to function for longer, hopefully for longer without getting injured, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I think tolerance could be if it has good tolerance. Sometimes people use this term synonymously, but it will then have the capacity. Capacity is usually, oh, if something has capacity, it has a certain like lifespan where before it gets injured or it, it reduces in performance, I guess. Um, but it, de it develops these qualities so we then can use them in a sporting context. Um, and if it has those tolerances, it should be able to deal with those stresses more easily. That means we can then perform certain movements uh, with requiring less energy, which is clearly very important for things like long distance running. Uh, if we're running at the same speed, but I'm burning more energy than you are, that means I have a poorer economy, probably have a poorer level of tolerance in my tissues because I'm not able to do it. That's a very crude way of thinking about it because there's so many other factors involved. Uh, but get that kind of gist. Like we are trying to improve our tolerance and capacity of our tissues so we're able to perform uh, sporting performance, whatever requirements the, that sport needs of us. So you've touched on something that's very, very dominant within the narrative of this space, which is essentially injury prevention, which comes down to our tolerance to sort of receive force, I mm. guess, if we're going to, I'm going to put it crudely this time. <laughs> but that's ultimately where the strength and conditioning injury prevention narrative comes from because if you are not exposing your tendons, your ligaments, your muscles to force, then when force is applied, they will have a lower capacity to be able to tolerate that, which puts you at higher risk of injury. It's not quite as clear cut as that in the literature, is it? But essentially that is the mechanism that we're working to. So a, a knee joint, let's use the example mm -hmm. of Doris from down the road would argue that squats are bad for your knees because you're putting a lot of weight through the movement. Why is this not the case? <laughs> well, the body can't respond to, um, or the body needs load because the load is what is the stimulus that creates the remodeling. So cartilage, bone, uh, you know, tendon it all responds to force if you take that force away like we do in say you've got an astronaut in space 
then it starts to break down. It becomes much more weak, much more brittle. Um, so we need that. We need that level of um, force to stimulate that type of growth, uh, and it's the same for for Doris. Um, ultimately, if you know if you don't use it, then all of a sudden you start to lose it over time, um, and that's why it's so important to start training early and then carry that on into later life, because you are then setting up a higher level of tolerance for that when that remodeling process starts to slow down as you get older then um, you're coming from a much more improved level of, of tolerance. So hopefully that reduces the risk of injury uh, to a much later in life. So yeah, uh, I hope Doris is all right. Um, yeah, me too. Me too, Doris. I hope all is well and that, that you are well stocked on where there's originals apparently in this. And cardigans. My, my imagination I've created. Anyway, you touched on something there which is fascinating and I think it's probably worth doing an entire podcast on if NDAs research releases allow the mm. astronaut side of things you are mm -hmm. working with astronauts to basically decrease atrophy in space and that perfectly frames what we were just discussing there because when muscle is not being used when ligaments are not being used when tendons are not being used they are weakening which means that you are then exposed to force reception upon dry land land mm. just regular land again if they say mm. we're not at sea here but how, what are the considerations for those astronauts how, how is it all working give us give us an overview but don't go too in depth because we want to keep something for a specific episode and what is a very very fascinating topic yeah funny enough i gave a lecture on this today um so we are typically an astronaut say they went to the international space station they'd be up there for about six months on average one, because there's a lot to do up there, but two, it's really expensive to send them up there and back. So they've got to spend quite a bit of time there. And, you know, if you take away gravity, they start to see that degradation of the human body. You know, your tendons and muscles get weaker. You start to atrophy and you get reduced bone mineral density. And it becomes a real problem for when they get back to Earth. Um, quite a lot of the time, they have to be retaught how to, to run. Um, and a lot of the things that we are doing at the moment is trying to see if we can get um, jumping as part of their training while in space. Um, because at the moment, we can't. Um, and the reason for that is because, say if I jumped up and down on some kind of plate on the in the space station, that force would then get transferred into what the plate's attached to, which is the craft. So you actually risk damaging the International Space Station just because you want to jump. So we Imagine need to find being a... that much of a bro. Exactly. Get a pump on and destroy the yeah. international. I need space to do station. my depth jumps. <laughs> Screw international relations. Three, three to, red uh... lights, and you destroyed the international space station. Good <laughs> grief, Steve! What are you doing? But um, yes, yeah, so we need to find a way of getting them to jump in space, but without transferring that force or vibration into the rest of the craft. So we've got a, a jump sled, which we've been testing out and we can jump in microgravity because I've done that old vomit comet. We've got some initial data which shows that you can. When we tested that, it was the first time anyone had ever jumped in microgravity um, or jumped as if they were jumping on the Earth's surface. So, for example, you know, people have been jumping in you know, spacesuits on the moon, but uh, uh, because there's less gravity, you sort of like bounce along. But um, no one's actually had some kind of... Um, jump like force applied to them in microgravity um so that's what we've done so far but we need to do some initial testing uh, no further testing to try and make sure that that vibration isolation uh, is um, not being transferred to the rest of the craft it gets reduced a lot in our machine uh, but there's a there's something we need to look a bit further on so that's the next step um, i can release that information because it's actually in a in a paper that's out in the public domain so i'm only explaining some stuff there's a few other things i can't say um but um yeah there's that information is public knowledge so um, we'll, di we'll dive into that in more detail soon but the one thing i do want to pick up on before we move on is vomit comet i think i would be Wrong not to pick up on that for, for those listening and watching in asking what, <laughs> what that is. <laughs> yeah, so the plane is it's not custom built. It's an old Boeing, uh, and it's lined with like padding so that you can, well, as soon as you come out of microgravity, you don't plummet to the floor of the, the plane. Um, 
And what it does, it's just a plane that's flying along. If only people could see this because I'm using my hand. It looks a bit stupid. But say your, your plane's going along and then it will go up like that, like at a 50 degree angle. So it'll climb up. Uh, and when you actually climb up like that, you experience double gravity. So you feel the G-force like pulling you against the floor. So if you're sitting down on your ass, it's actually really uncomfortable because it kind of like pulls you like that. Uh, and then once you reach the top, it feels like they shut the engine off and you just plummet towards the ground. So you, you kind of like create like a hill-like shape in the path of the plane. And at the top, you experience uh, 22 seconds of microgravity. So that's where we're doing our jump testing. And then when they pull, pull out of the uh, dive of the plane, you experience um, double gravity again. So essentially, as the path of the plane, you're at gravity, then double gravity, then zero gravity, then double gravity, back to gravity. So because you're going in and out of gravity like that, it can make people throw up. And people did throw up, and it was and it was hilarious. With um, my uh, with my experience of gravity to date, the uh, breakdown <laughs> of v- variety in gravity there sounded awful. So I think I'll I'll leave that to the. Trend it's a weird north. feeling, like a weird imagine. feeling. I can imagine. Uh, but, have, you, have you done it? You, you've you've done the vomit comet. Yeah, I've done it. So, so I've experienced microgravity. 93 times wow because there's 31 parabolas per flight we did three flights so you experience 31 tw- bouts of microgravity per flight so that's a lot of microgravity did, 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 the, we all need to know did, did you throw up were you just on a comet or were you on a vomit comet no i didn't throw up ah, but well art. we had because you can take uh it's like a C, you know, like a car sickness medicine before you go on. Um, so I, I took that the first time. And the come down off that drug is much worse than any kind of sickness you feel in the in the uh, in the plane. So I was like, screw that, I'm not having that. Like it was a horrible, like think hangover, but your mouth tastes of lead. It was horrible. So if anyone wants to know what this feels like, it feels like next time you've had 12 pints on a Saturday, eat a pencil on the Sunday and get back to us. <laughs> yeah. But I, I am conscious we have drifted very much. We've into, drifted a long way. We've drifted a long, <laughs> pun very much intended as well. We have, we have abandoned gravity and we are floating in nothingness, but to return to somethingness, we are going to, how do we even get here? We got onto astronauts needed resistance we talk about training. Doris. Everybody in the need is needed resistance training. Doris, astronauts, here we are. So I think the big misconception that's probably worth trying to tackle today is I'm going to use another phrase, and I'm not going to make this just a point scoring in terms of, right, let's let's say one thing and debunk it this way, but I'm a runner. I should run. Hmm. Why do runners need strength training? Ooh, good question as well. And it's something I touched upon on the first lecture I gave on the Omnium Performance Premium. So very good, very good. I'm actually going to broaden that out as block. well. I, I am ex athlete, boxer, triathlete, mm-hmm. the figure skater, whatever it is. I should figure skate. I should box, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why do I need strength training? I'm not a bodybuilder. Oh, I don't need to do any of that weight stuff. Oh, that's bad for your back. All this stuff that we've heard over and over and over again. We'll see in countless Facebook threads and countless slow switch threads. I'm sure, but. Why is that not the case? And we're not mm. talking bro splits. We're not talking powerlifting, strong lifts, five by five. But equally, the spectrum that we're working to here is is actual resistance. Training under load, under resistance. Why do all athletes need it? Mm. Do, athlete, do all athletes need it? Yes, certainly. Because the body will require... Um, Again, kind of going back to my original point was like it, it requires a certain level of, of tolerance to be able to deal with the imposed demands of that sport. So whether that's dealing with the stress that is placed upon the body, either from external forces or needs to be created by the body um, for their sporting performance, we need to provide some kind of overload so we have the physical physiological qualities to be able to either deal or create that force. So, you know, that that translates to any type of sport at all. Um, yes, you get a lot of those sport-specific types of uh, adaptations just by p- doing the sport itself. But through additional training, we can provide uh, different levels of overload 
to better prepare the athlete for their given demands of their sport. So, you know, S and C for these sports, it's, it's supplementary. You know, you, you just do what's necessary and overload them in a certain way so they can develop the physical capabilities to be able to do the um, the sport itself. It isn't like you do S and C, then you become a sportsman. So, no, you, you play sport. You do that a lot because you're going to get better at practicing that sport. But adding in some additional strength training will provide the necessary uh, stimuli to better prepare you to do that sport and whether that is to deal with the levels of stress coming from the sport or you have a better let you have better strength so you're able to perform skills better in sports for example you know maybe you know uh some snc training to make you a better sprinter will then translate to your better performance if you're a football player especially if you're on the wing um you know they it definitely all transfers Good example is just because I'm still bitter about Scotland almost beating New Zealand at the weekend. Mm. Is if you are a fly half and you're, you're you're kicking, you might think, well, I'm a very skilled, dominant athlete. Obviously, you need to have some element of S and C to be able to keep up with the physicality of rugby these days. But the S and C that goes into being a fly half and distributing the ball and fulfilling those skills means that S and C will give you a higher tolerance to execute those skills over a set period of time. So let's say completely hypothetically, but you have a thousand kicks before you injure your hip flexor without S and C. S and C might be what allows you to get to 1500 kicks before you have a niggle or an injury in your hip flexor, because it just increases that tolerance and that capacity. It's not avoiding injury entirely. It is just elevating the ceiling of risk associated with certain movement patterns. And I think that's where that's where the misconception comes from. But I think then from a programming point of view, there's often a misconception that if you are lifting during the week, you are eating into adaptive energy, you're eating into time, you're eating into a session slot that could otherwise be devoted to a run or a cycling session or another swim or another skill focused session. So I think it's important to reframe perspective on where S and C sits within the spectrum of an individual sport, but also to as coaches and uh, as, as general athletes in terms of considering S and C to one athlete is not the same as it is to the other. A power lifters lifting structure is going to be very, very different to a figure skaters lifting structure and very, very different to an astronauts lifting structure, mm. for example. And that's where the nuance comes in, but why ultimately increasing your tolerance to execute certain movements over time can only be a good thing. And we've kind of gone all the way out, but I think it's probably worth just bringing it back a little bit for clarity before we sort of finish up here is the real, real simple low hanging fruit benefits, the reps level two and level three benefits of resistance training and why ultimately if we're wanting to be healthy, sustainable athletes, because you and I both very much agree, Johnny agrees as well that the best athlete in the room is the most sustainable one because if you're fluctuating from injuries over time, if you're not able to build momentum and consistency over time, then you're going to be fluctuating psychologically, physically, there's going to be demands that come with that. So sustainability is king. And the more that you can create that for yourself, the better athlete you'll be in the long term. So bone density, let's go back to Doris. Lifting, base level resistance training, simple progression over time without huge amounts of volume can have big health impacts further down the line. And we're not going to insult people's intelligence and go through the NHS guidelines on this, but I know you work with, what's his name? Is it Roger? The, the Waltosaurus. The Waltosaurus, yes. How yeah. old is he? 79. So let's use him as an example, just to contextualize this in terms of resistance training for health because we often talk a lot about performance. And I think ultra ultra endurance, multiple Ironmans, things like this. Listeners, people that are listening, probably I'm, I'm very much guilty of this myself. We go to the other end of the spectrum where actually the exercise becomes unhealthy. It becomes damaging in certain ways. Pick your poison is what I'll say to that. Mm. But in general terms, the health benefits of resistance training, let's retract to that a little bit before we summarize with the overall performance benefits using the, the Waltosaurus, as I Waltosaurus. now know he is called, as the example. Yeah, ultimately, what I try to achieve with Walter, uh, and I'm lucky to be in a position where I can push a little bit more, but that's because we've been training together for 15 years. Hold on. Since 2006. It'll be longer than that. 16 years. Yeah. How old so, is Walter? 79. 79, 79. So 63 to 79. Mm. 
So yeah, we've been working together for quite some time. Like I, when I was a personal trainer in central London, uh, he was there at the gym. And then when he became semi-retired, I got the job at the university. So he was like, well, in my off days, I'll come down and train at the university with you. So we've done that ever since. And because of that, we've developed a certain level of tolerance over certain exercises, which we know we can push a little bit more. And then I do some additional stuff regarding um, usually around uh, his feet. In terms of him walking, he has a, he tends to shuffle. So he uses one side of his body probably a lot more. Now I'm not trying to spend hours trying to retrain his gait, but I try and give his body an increased level of tolerance slash capacity so that hopefully he will then utilize that in going back to his everyday skills, like getting up and out of a chair, walking up and down stairs, walking, that sort of thing. Uh, because if you shuffle, then you're not going to be, you know, coming onto your toe as much. You're not going to be plantar flexing. So then all of, a, all of a sudden your body doesn't tend to use that. So through outside training, we try and train. We do some tiptoe walks, some calf raises, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, a few bits. Um, ultimately to be, develop some strength there so they could, take that into his skill of walking and rather than teaching him how to walk he knows how to walk it's just probably hasn't done it because he hasn't had the capacity to do it um so yeah that's what we've tried tend to do it's just give getting developing capacity out of water so he's able to do much more we don't think too uh too in depth as to exactly what we want to do so we we focus it around certain exercises that he enjoys and we know he can load and then other things are just you know given capacity around key musculature that you might need for walking and um he says he goes for a physical every year and he says that it comes back with really good results and surprisingly good bone density for a man his age which can only come from the fact that he can rap yeah. pull 100 kilos at 79 <laughs> years old there you go. There you go. It's one thing to do a body weight rack pull, but it's uh, it's another thing to do a one point two age rack pull. In, yeah. in, in his terms, isn't it? That's that's the, the sort of decreasing curve as that goes on. If you can, if you can rack pull a hundred at hundred, I'll be very impressed. But we'll keep going. Well, we'll see where we end up. So the point that I think it's worth finishing on, but just really important to make clear, especially within the context of endurance training, because. Again, I don't seem like I'm bashing anyone, but I'm just really keen to make this point clear for those that that might not understand why the nuance between prehab and rehab exercises versus actual resistance training is important to consider. Because I think there's a bit of a mm. bit of a blurry boundary in some endurance sports in terms of what those things are, and what <laughs> it's important to mention why loaded resistance training is significantly more beneficial than four sets of 15 crab walks or bilateral side hops or weightless donkey kicks and all these things that you'll see in in mobility and strength and conditioning exercises occasionally as bolt-ons to a running program or something like that. When in reality, a small dosage of actual resistance load will have a lot more impact for a lot less time given. And whilst the movements themselves could be perceived as intimidating, not something I want to seem ignorant or naive to, of course, making the time and setting aside the time to understand those movements, become proficient in them, and then to be able to execute them under load, I think is very important for every level of person with ambitions as any sort of athlete, but especially within the space of endurance. Because if you're a sub eight hour Iron Manner, Iron Man athlete rather, but struggle to do a bodyweight squat, I'd say there is a exposed risk there and something that can be improved upon. I'm not saying you need to go and squat three plates for sets of five, but to be able to execute a bodyweight squat, to be able to execute a 60 kilo squat through a full range of motion, motion can only be a good thing because it just improves your overall robustness and resilience within that movement pattern. So in scientific terms, Phil, do you want to explain why <clears throat> resistance training in terms of resistance, quote unquote, training should take precedence over the sort of more fashionable rehab exercises we often see being bunged into the category of resistance training, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's a disconnect in some people where um, I guess this injury prevention may get people get confused around it because you, 
you're not preventing injury because you you're not 100 percent sure that what you're doing is going to prevent an injury you're doing strength training to try and reduce the risk of it happening so in turn you are preventing some injury because there's a less chance of an injury but uh you know there's a big difference um and then you get the two different camps where you know people are like oh you know we're doing these prehab type exercises but risk problem- reduction and risk reduction i was just thinking in the background that risk reduction over injury prevention we shall yeah. endeavor to use the phrase risk reduction moving forwards on this podcast in place of injury prevention when it comes to strength and conditioning for endurance sports mm. sorry as you were no 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 you, you can never guarantee that you uh will the athlete that you're coaching is going to not receive an injury. You can't, there's too many factors to be able to predict that, but you do your best to try and reduce that risk. And one of the ways of doing that is to load the system. So the neuromuscular system is able to, you know, tolerate high forces. Um, yes. I, I mean, I, when it comes to S and C, I'm not really that bothered in terms of what people do in terms of like, Oh, that exercise isn't really S and C. Um, you know, I, you can load the body however you want. If you've got a rationale for doing it, I don't really care what it looks like. But you can't do sort of very low intensity exercises and then not load the system because then you're not going to get that training to the neuromuscular system as the way as uh, you know very light intensity going through range is going to. I like to think both. Um, the, 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 I liked your uh, example of crab walks because <laughs> in crab walks, you're going from quite a shortened glute me position to a really shortened glute me position. And that's not really how muscles work. Every time you land, like your muscles need to lengthen the muscle spindles will detect that length change and then activate the muscle. So the muscles need to, the best muscles are the ones that lengthen and then they shorten. So if you're going to go through like this motion where it's like short to shorter, it's like, it's not really mimicking what's going to happen in the, in the actual event. So um, yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of crab walks um, apart from the fact that they give you this feeling of, um or they're really active but it's because you're just increasing the time under tension in that area and going through like really short range of motion in it but i guess that's a different uh, yeah, the same, so the, we'll, we'll retitle the podcast why yeah. phil hates crab walks <laughs> um but yeah but, uh, uh, i think the, really the, nuance, the nuance is it's intensity isn't it, it, it mm. it's it's resistance training needs to be performed at a certain level of intensity. So to put it within the framework of an endurance athlete, for example, and again, I want to make crystal clear, this is in no way bashing or undermining or any of that. It's just a case of trying to, from my perspective as somebody who dips their toe in both, Mm. trying to provide value from one party to the other if somebody's at one end of the spectrum versus the other, for example. So if you, it would be frustrating for a runner to watch a powerlifter say, I'm going to get better at running by doing nothing but walking in the same vein for those that are proficient in strength movements. It would be frustrating for a runner to say, Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my strength movements and you watch them do banded crab walks or weightless donkey kicks, for example, because whilst the movement is carrying over or the movement is executing the premise of what is trying to be achieved the key detail missing from both of those things is the intensity required to actually stimulate, stimulate a response. Mm -hmm. So obviously movement efficiency is paramount. So if you can't do a donkey kick with weight, then you need to get a weightless donkey kick nailed first and foremost in the same way. We're not saying get under a barbell and hit the floor with your glutes before you can effectively execute a bodyweight squat. But understanding that strength training is not there to mimic the work you're doing on the track, on the bike, in the pool. It's there to provide a supplementary response that makes those things better, which is why the age old myth of, oh, I should only do high reps because I'm an endurance athlete. It's in fact the opposite because you're getting a lot of that response from the endurance work. So you need to go to the other end of the spectrum and do heavy, hard executed, well moving, fast moving reps. And then if we take the strength athlete, 
oh, well, I should only do sprints because I'm a strength dominant athlete. Well, no, you should probably do zone two work because that's what's going to elevate your aerobic capacity high, high enough to improve your recovery, improve your tolerance for volume. And I think that's a big misconception that's kind of spiraled a bit out of control in this space, which means that as hybrid athletes, I assume those most of us listening, we can sit somewhere in the middle, but we again need to be sensible in terms of how we distribute the, those things. And if there's coaches listening, we need to work with the individual on where they are versus where they want to be and create that roadmap that allows them to do that, which is the hierarchy is really movement efficiency, suitable intensity, progression over time, uh, rinse and repeat, trial and error until you get to the end goal, essentially. But in that order, you shouldn't be just getting a triathlete under a barbell because you believe they should be doing strength training. There's, there's more of a pathway to get there, but the, the, they should be doing strength training. From a general health point of view, I would make the argument that everybody should be doing strength training. If I was Minister of Health, I'd probably make claims about that, but I am unfortunately not, which means that I don't have a clear way in to I'm a celebrity, apparently, because um, <laughs> that's something you can do now from politics. Well, but nonetheless... Health minister uh, might change next week, so uh, you might yeah, have a shot. I might, yeah. Well, yeah, this podcast could be could be it. So if anyone's listening that has any ins, then <laughs> something in the show notes below. <laughs> a petition, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. But nonetheless, I, I, I think the real point here is I, I really want to make clear that I'm not, not trying to undermine any one position, but encourage the perspective of the position that you're in, the box that you're in, the, the bias that you have to strength or endurance – Resistant training can have a huge benefit for endurance athletes in the same way that endurance training can have a huge benefit for strength athletes. Those camps like to fight with one another because that's what camps do. We're human beings. But I think those listening and as a business and Phil as an academic study, we would like to sit in the middle and help more people understand how to make this most effective. So I think the real summary point is resistance training is no different to your endurance training, whereby to elicit the response desired, it needs to be done at the correct and relevant intensity, which is something that you should execute and take on once you can move through the movement patterns efficiently. So hopefully that makes sense, but I'm going to make the case that everybody with any athletic ambitions should be doing some form of resistance training and the intensity required is what matters most there. And just whilst we're on the topic, if you're a strength dominant athlete, some zone two work probably wouldn't hurt if you're not doing any. And maybe some zone two more work, some zone two more work, some more zone two work could have more of a benefit if you are doing a little bit already. So I think we can all learn a lot from one another. And that is the beauty of the modern world, whereby we have access to lots of information. But the beauty of hybrid training means that it can mean whatever you want it to mean. You can sit in one camp, you can sit in another, you can mix and match whatever sports you want. But that means that we can't really paint too many things with a broad brushstroke. All we can do is compare perspectives and better understand one another. And most importantly, learn from one another. Because there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of experts that have nailed one far end of the spectrum, but might not have any concept of the complete other end of the spectrum. So how fantastic is it that we can access both of those information points and try and find somewhere to meet in the middle as athletes, individuals, weekend warriors, whatever we want, whatever we want to call ourselves. So... I, there wasn't really a point there in my final summary, but Phil, anything to add before we round off? No, I thought that was an excellent summary. And uh, interesting, you mentioned towards the end that hybrid training can be whatever you want it to be, which I think is really important. And I'm highlighting it because I started talking about it in my uh, lecture on Omnia Performance Premium. I keep sliding it in He's there. Good. He's good. Life is um, sales, Phil. Life is sales. Exactly. So yeah, I would discuss about all the, the variables that are at your disposal, disposal, disposal. Oh, it's a long day today. Um, to ultimately try and create your own idea of what hybrid training is for you. That will vary based on what your goals are and then what kind of variables that you're shooting for. You know, those variables could be like, what are your um you know, it's different for someone that's a powerlifter and a runner versus someone that's a powerlifter and a triathlete. Completely different, and that's absolutely fine. But that means you've got uh, so many variables there to manipulate and create and determine what kind of training response you want to get out of your hybrid training. So uh, definitely check that out. But uh, yeah, your summary was much better than mine. If anyone is interested in on your performance premium, but would like a discount code as you are listening at whatever the tail end of the podcast, we would like to reward you with 25% off. So athlete 25 will get you 25% off. If you sign up, I think within a fortnight of this podcast going live, when 
I'll set it so it's within a fortnight of this podcast going live. Mm. Again, I tried to do maths live on a podcast, which is something I need to stop myself from doing to save potential embarrassment. But nonetheless, Athlete 25 will get you 25% off Omni Performance Premium if you would like to sign up to have a year's worth of syllabus that we already have planned out and ready to be drip fed over the year with live Q and A's, chat rooms, loads of stuff going on in there. Go and check it out. Lots more in-depth conversation on topics like the one we've been discussing today and in previous weeks. So do please check it out. Podcasty stuff, follow, subscribe, share with a friend, share your story, tell Doris, all that stuff, please. And do your resistance training and eat your greens. I think is is how we'll summarize today. So thank you again for listening. Cheers, guys.